we agree we should start. During the morning we had several very interesting and instructive presentations regarding the problem of honey frog. Many of the speakers you saw this morning are also here. The mode of work is a little different. The speakers will have a quite short time to refresh some concepts and then we will give a whole hour to debate, to questions. So the first hour the actors are here, the second hours you are the actors. So in the first term I would like to introduce Mrs. Gina Clapper. Gina Clapper works at the U.S. Pharmacopeia. She is uh, leading the U.S. expert panel who is preparing the so long-awaited U.S. standard for health. So, Gina, you are mostly welcome Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I have just a very brief um, overview of just a little bit about why public standards can help uh, combat food fraud and what U.S. Pharmacopeia and the Food Chemicals Codex team at USP are doing to help in the honey industry. So a little bit about Food Chemicals Codex, if you're not familiar. It was created by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as well as the National Institute of Medicine in 1966. It's currently published by USP, which is a scientific, non-government, non-profit organization. We currently have more than 1,250 standards for additives, ingredients, and other food chemicals. The standards are all developed by um, expert <laughs> volunteers and only fully independent source of food ingredient standards available. The U.S. Honey Expert Panel was established in 2018. Many members of the panel are here at the conference. Some are here on the panel as well. And we work with several government liaisons, both in the U.S. and Canada as well, to ensure that the work that we're doing um, will we'll work globally. The intention, though we were approached by the U.S. industry, the intention is that this identity standard could be used and applied globally. So an FCC identity standard, it's an informational document designed to assist users in determining the identity uh, or authenticity of a food ingredient or an agricultural product. Honey is both a food ingredient and an agricultural product. Um, for which a full monograph is not uh, currently existing in, in FCC. It generally, an identity standard includes far more tests for identification than just um, a regular monograph. Generally, monographs have one test that will definitively say, yes, this is sodium, no, this is not sodium. As we've heard this morning, and as you all live every day, there is not one test that can tell you whether honey is, in fact, honey, which is why we're working to draft this identity standard. So our committee met here in Montreal, actually just right around the corner from this room, on Friday to discuss. Uh, they've been working monthly by uh, teleconference to develop and draft the standard, sending data and literature back and forth to support the limits that we're putting in this test, in this identity standard. And the expert panel has completed their work right now. And so not to be too boring, there is a long cycle of things that happen on the production side at USP. And so that is initiating as soon as I'm back in the office next week to transform the document into FCC format. 
I'd like to let you know that you should expect to see the document before June 30th or June 30th, 2020 at the latest, where it will be published in the FCC forum. I've provided a, um, a website there where you can go and register for um, complimentary access to the FCC forum. And when we propose standards, monographs, general tests, they are available for 90 days for public comment and all comments are addressed sort of in a similar fashion to when governments uh, put, put information out. And with that, um, my contact information, gina.clapper at usp.org and I will pass to the next speaker. Thank you. As you may know, is so complex that uh, indeed there is no one perfect method as we uh, heard this morning. So it's, uh, many important reference in <coughs> quality testing, high purity testing, will now refresh some of the concepts we gave this morning with the expect this um, specific objective to try to describe the best combination of methods to different kinds of adulteration, to different uh, histories of adulteration, to different countries of origin. That is our goal, to leave uh, this room with clearer concepts, with, with the best combo of methods for different situations. So, um, I would like to invite Dr. Bernkamp from FUTQS in Germany. He will share with us some of his part of his knowledge, which is very huge. So thank you for the invitation. Um, first I have to apologize myself because uh, for my short presentation, because Norberto asked me today in the morning at 8 o'clock if it is possible to hate a presentation. So I have done my best and okay, let us see. So. Uh, my name is Ben Kemp from uh, the company FoodQS. What is FoodQS? FoodQS is a commercial lab in Germany. It is located in the south of Germany, in Bavaria. We have more than 20 years experience in the analytics of bee products, honey, worldwide. And of course we do uh, further analytics like beeswax, bee pollen, royal trelly, or syrups for example, the gave syrups, maple syrups. Um, of course, we are accredited to Dean 17.025. So what we are doing, we do the all important, all relevant analysis for honey, uh, chemically, physical parameters, antibiotics, heavy metals, GMO. You can read this from the slide uh, by your own. <coughs> um, regarding authenticity, we can uh, distinguish uh, some, some areas uh, to check honey for uh, adulteration. And the first one, and the oldest one, is pollen. Uh, it's for the detection of the botanical or the geographical origin. Then we have the enzymes, amylase, beta, gamma, amylase, uh, honey, honey foreign enzymes, heat stable enzymes, or beta fructoforanisidase. The sugar sticks rose, uh, well known until 20 years. The honey, uh, the foreign oligosaccharides, and different markers, isotopics, and NMR as well. What is missing? LCHRMS is missing. This is the new technology. What is our approach using LCMSMS? We have this system since 2016. We use this uh, technology. This is a technology, not a met, uh, method. We uh, use this just for research and development. What is our approach? We are searching for market substances in various different uh, kind types of syrups. Then we uh, identify this uh, market substances to her correct chemical name to say what it is. Then we prove and check this is, is necessary if the substance is only available in syrups and not natural occurring in any type of honey. 
We know different uh, examples like gamma amiras is natural occurring in, in avocado or some other markers are, uh, will be found in, in different types of honey. So we have to check if this marker is definitely only occurring in syrups. So we need a honey database. Then we, we try to explain why is the marker substance in this zero syrup. For example, the way of production is one uh, possibility. Yeah, we, we, we check the plausibility. Then we will transfer the method, the way of detection, to the more sensitive LCMSMS method. This is if, if it is uh, if if you can buy the substance commercial, this is possible. Yeah, because LCMSMS is more sensitive than LC. HRMS. What is the summary of our approach? We have uh, uh, ide uh, the identification of SMB has finished. Um, we know the name. The name is 3-methoxyturamine. We have published this this year in cooperation with QSI. Then we have the RSM marker identif uh, identified as glucosyl isomaltol, and we have further marker identified identified and we have published this in this year as well. What can we do with uh, these results? We have a product, we have now 11 marker substances. Yeah, you can order one, uh, then one order, we analyze 11 marker substances to best get information regarding uh, honey adulteration yeah, with the sensitive LCMSMS analytics. Yeah, different syrups were considered depending on the marker, for example, beet sugar, rice, or wheat, and to complete the adulteration analytics, if it's needed, you can also order NMR or isotopic analytics. Thank you for your attention. for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the honey authenticity issue from the analytical point of view in general and give you a little bit about the history, how the authenticity tests evolve, evolved over the time and what is our current state of the art, how we assess honey authenticity. Uh, for those who don't know Eurofeeds, we are a very big <coughs> network worldwide with over 100, 800 uh, laboratories in 47 countries. Uh, the red dots, these are the food laboratories and we are one of that uh, in the northern part of Germany. Uh, our lab is really specialized into honey and beehive products and this started nearly three years ago and we serve for all the food laboratories of Europeans worldwide dealing with honey and beehive products. Um, we are mainly focused on food integrity tasks. So um, food integrity covers four major areas like food authenticity, food defense, food safety and food quality. And what we are doing is tr trying to draw a line between the accidental contamination or adulteration, which may happen by the beekeeper, for example, if he feeds the bees with sugar syrup and the actual or intentional adulteration the food fraudsters actually do. That's what, what we are trying to catch, the intentional adulteration. Um, just this year in Europe there has been a big uh, norming project start, started by the European norming body, the CEN. A new technical group has been formed dealing with food authenticity and this group as a, as a 
first work package, they defined what is authentic food. Authentic food is uh, the match between the food characteristics and the product claim on the label. If that matches, then the food is authentic. And they also defined, not, not an exclusive list, but they defined a list of methods which could be used to verify if food is authentic or not. And for honey, we are using already more or less all of the methods mentioned there, and especially stable isotopes, NMR, uh, mass spectrometry, of course, still we use also pollen microscopy. So these are the methods we are using. And also, this group is now dealing with the latest state-of-the-art methods, which are called untargeted methods. So both targeted methods, where we have a clear marker, which tells us if a food or a honey is adulterated, can be used, or also non-targeted methods, in order to also uh, discover new types of adulteration we do not know yet. This is just a short extract of a, of a guideline document. Also, this technical group has been published through ISO and, uh, uh, sorry, through CEN. And this basically uh, is a, is a tr decision tree when you say a food is authentic or not authentic or where you have actually food fraud. And the part we are focusing is the product tampering part. So, um, for us from, from the industry side, or from the side which is not the regulatory side, our major challenge for the test, testing is really to find a way which gives you the best confidence, a uh, cost-effective and affordable way to test the product. And honey is a natural product with a large variation and that makes it so difficult to find a really good testing strategy. Honey is so diverse all over the world that we sometimes need different strategies for authenticity testing in different parts of the world. But the new technologies we have nowadays, they enable us to simplify the process and the recommendations how to assess honey. Um, this is just a short overview of the evolution of honey authenticity methods over the past 30-40 years. So it started in the late 1970s with the so-called stable isotope methods for protein and honey, the so-called SIRA method, where we only could detect C4 sugars like sugar cane and corn. Later on, in the early 2000s, it was discovered that more and more other syrups from sea free sugar plants like beet sugar or rice syrup are used to adulterate honey, so we needed to develop other methods. So there was a further improved stable isotope method which came into place, and later on, as the production of syrups used as adulterant also improved over time to pass these tests, more and more individual methods had to be developed, like those for foreign enzymes, for enzymatically produced sugar syrups, or, for example, in 2011, first individual specific marker methods for uh, syrups produced from starch. And this went on and on until, let's say, 2012, 2013, where we the first development of a, of a more general screening method uh, was introduced also for honey, that was the NMR profiling, which really takes a picture of the whole composition of the honey and tries to identify adulterated samples by comparing it with a database of authentic honey samples. Nevertheless, also this method is not bulletproof. There we already today also know that this technique can be circumvented by very sophisticated adulterations. So we also need, from time to time, new tools to cover also the lag, the current lag we have in authenticity testing. And as the newest 
method my other colleague here already presented. Now LCHRMS, high resolution mastic, comes into place, which complements the other techniques uh, for adulteration testing. Um, HRMS works different to NMR. Um, somehow you can use it in different ways, but um, we do not uh, or did not try to do the same as with NMR to compare a large database of authentic honeys with honeys which are in the market. We really try to identify the cyrups which are used to adulterate honey and made a database of the cyrups itself. So basically the method works independently from the uh, honeys we look at worldwide. Um, the basic principle is that we have typical marker profiles of certain sugar syrups and if we find these profiles of the sugar syrups in the honey we can tell this type of honey has been added fraudulently to the honey. This is how it works. Um, just to give you an overview on, on, on the left part of the slide, these were for example the number of methods used two or three years ago. Uh, a lot of methods, of course, high cost testing costs. Now with this new technique, we can reduce the number of methods, we can reduce the cost, and we have at least the same, if not a better confidence that the product is really authentic. Um, just one more or less last slide. This is uh, a slide of all the uh, honey adulteration tests we do in our laboratory and um, on the second um, column this is the percentage uh, <coughs> this, the individual test is done of, on all of our honey samples so for example stable, stable isotope testing in the first row is done on 42 percent of all the honey samples we get and you can see in the second row that this new Technology is already used on 39% of all the samples we get. So we get already a lot of uh, confidence uh, in this new method. And uh, I made a, s s uh, a very short, uh, not very comprehensive comparison, just 2019 versus 2018, in the rate of positive findings. This is the third and fourth column. So you can see the average rate of positive findings we have for all the samples. And you can see that the, the more simple, the older methods, they have rather low rates of positive findings and we really require the new, the more sophisticated techniques like NMR, high resolution MS and stable isotopes to be really sure to detect uh, fraudulent uh, practices in the honey. This slide just gives you an impression of, about these three techniques I just mentioned and their analytical capa ca uh, capabilities for different types of honey fraud. So this is more or less a very coarse black-white painting, but it gives you a first impression and I want to point out by the green, green row for the HRMS that, you, that it's a very versatile technique and you can use it for many aspects of honey authenticity. So I guess it will be the future and uh, will be an important part of authenticity testing in the future. So this is the team which is in our lab. You ask me and my colleague, you can uh, visit at our booth in C92. If you have any questions, even after the round table, and thank you for your attention.
I think each of the big three, four, or five labs are doing the same testing and can offer the same services. So the question is the interpretation and what we recommend to you. So I want to keep this presentation pretty short to give you more time for discussion and for questions because I think this is the most important part. So you saw this slide already and uh, big kudos to Ron Phipps, he's kind of famous for this chart, so everybody's using this and uh, is basing all his uh, presentations on this. Uh, what I did, I just made a little history of the iteration testing to get a feeling which tests are actually showing positive results and uh, how much percentage. So I used all our database and here in this slide we have more than half a million analyzes. So starting from 2014 to 2018, so last year analyzes. And I will, what you can see is, uh, so on the x-axis are the years and on the y-axis are the percent, how much uh, percentage of the samples were okay by this testing. And what you can typically see is, for example, the is it purple, red? I don't know, I don't know so good at colors. So this line uh, is showing the AOEC method, so the classical T13 method. And you can see from 2014 there were 80% of the samples passing and it's nearly at 95, 98% now. So just 2%, uh, 3% of the actual samples are failing. So this is the LCIRMS method with a higher uh, amount of samples which are passing because basically if LC-IRMS is failing, normally it's the AOC method which is failing and the normal classical uh, part and not the sophisticated uh, LC part. This line, the green line, is a rice syrup marker. So it's kind of also high at 95% somewhere in this region. So actually the, the marker was introduced some years ago uh, before, so you could see this typical curve where it starts at 70%, so 30% of the samples are failing, and then it gets a separation to 95%. Same for SMB. Uh, and the last is actually pretty interesting because it's, N it's NMR, and we can see the typical curve which started at 50% of the samples, uh, which were okay. And nowadays we are around 80% of all the samples that were tested okay. So you can see also this saturation curve, which in scientist or which in scientific uh, world is a normal saturation of a normal saturation effect, and uh, which gives us the clue to say, okay, we need something else in addition to this. So 80% is also not a pretty good value, honestly, for the industry, because 20% are failing in the market still. So Hopefully this 20% are all syrups or kind of elaborations or other bad practices that we discover there. I honestly doubt if you have a 98% curve or result that the other 2% are really alliteration or if there are some other effects that we can see. So there is still room to improve. I already showed this slide so you all know this syrups and uh, uh, what is our strategy? What are we recommending actually for the duration test? Honestly, the only test method that are worse to use it are the screening test methods. So, for me, isotope still is kind of a screening because you don't focus on one marker. You are focusing on the total sample and on the isotope values, which is kind of difficult to manage. And if you use LCIRMS with the different peaks, it's also kind of an old school method, but it still works for some origins or some ways of alliteration. So in combination, we always recommend to do NMR to just have the fingerprint and know, okay, is there anything strange inside, which is maybe not possible to detect by this classical methods. And in future, the HRMS. So I know there's a lot of presentations about HRMS. In our opinion of QSI, the method is still not completely finished. So there is still research and you still have a high chance of having false positive, false negative results. Uh, just look on the SMB, which is actually HRMS targeted high resolution aspect. And you see the problems in Mexico that we had last year. So just to avoid these problems, we need a lot of more samples and a lot of more data just to avoid false positive. <laughs> 
catch at the end the uh, porridge, adulterated syrup, uh, honey, and not the wrong syrups or honeys, which are actually not adulterated, which are authentic. Uh, yeah, so please use isotopes and NMR in the future. HRMS is a great technique which has a lot of potential, which can add some more information to be absolutely sure. Nevertheless, the single methods like the foreign enzymes and this are also great to know more detailed. Okay, I have a strange NMR profile, maybe I can look more in detail in this, but this is the second step. The first step to screen is always NMR and isotopes. Yeah, so thank you very much. I'd like to welcome now to Mr. Thomas Spengler and Ia Heinz from Broker by your spin German. Good afternoon. So, um, as this meeting is meant as a round table, um, we also decided to be wanted to open the discussion and be transparent and really also show, show some figures about the different uh, techniques. So we start with the detection of sugar syrups because later I will also discuss about uh, the verification of the origin. So this has already been shown this morning and discussed before that the specific methods which really look to one specific marker, like for example foreign enzymes or some specific marker for rice syrup, these methods are really specific so you need to know what you are looking to and um, it will not be the best technique to start with. So as, as also QSI said before, uh, screening methods in our view will also be the starting point and these methods might be applied uh, if there is any specific doubt or gray zone, but we have to be aware that they are very easy to cheat, so negative result is also not a 100% certainty that the sample is authentic. So uh, now I would like to really deep more into the different technologies for screening, which I didn't do this morning. So the first one I want to talk about is the LCIRMS method. So what we would like to stress here um, is that uh, with these methods there are also no harmonization so there are the technology is the same but there are different labs uh, which have developed different methods and there is no harmonization in the parameters which are analyzed so how the data is measured processed and also which are finally the purity criteria used to assess if a sample is authentic or not and now I would like to give also some uh, really uh, results uh, on the field from Fami Michou Apiculteur, which kindly gave us that um, data recently, also asking the questions about the future of this technology and of applying it in the lab. Because currently they, they do this testing on all the raw material that they import. So they have tested over 5,000 samples since 2018 in April. And um, what can be seen, so that uh, 80 samples uh, of these 5,000 were non-conform with the LCIRMS method. But, yeah, amongst that, approximately the half was not detected by NMR. This has to be stressed out. Uh, but on the opposite side, 508 samples were detected as non-compliant with NMR. And from that, a very high portion was not detected by the LCIRMS, yes. So 476 were not detected by LCRS method. So if we summarize that, so the LCRS method was able to detect 0.87% of the adulterated samples, as which NMR did not, but NMR was able to detect 9.4% uh, of samples adulterated, which LCRMS was not able to. And in that frame, she was also asking us to have an open discussion in our uh, honey consortium, and also maybe open to more labs, of if that really makes sense in the future to do the testing uh, further, because the investment costs are very high. They, um, they spent uh, over 400,000 euro for this testing. So that is a point that would be nice to discuss. Uh, next one, the HRMS. So we had three presentations uh, from three different labs. So if, in my opinion, uh, it's a good potential to complement NMR. No discussion about that, because you will have a, another view on the, 
on the honey constituents which are the lower concentrated compounds, which NMR cannot access without any further sample preparation. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, here the point we have seen that there is one technology, so to say, but different instruments used, and also every time another method developed uh, by the different labs. So no harmonization. Everybody is trying to to start everything from scratch in his uh, in his way, which I personally found a little bit maybe not the most efficient, and maybe it would be better to to start something together. Because the most important in our view today is really to 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 put the labs together in order to agree also with governmental labs. Uh, what are the purity criteria used and to make sure they have been properly validated. So as of today, we didn't acquire any uh, HRMS uh, uh, tests on the samples to validate it for our database. All other tests are basically used today to validate the samples. And also we are not aware of any real comparative study available. So we heard uh, already uh, before and, to, and this morning about a rumor about a sample which has 30% adulteration that is not detected by NMR. It might be the case. I'm not saying NMR can detect everything. But again, here it would be nice to have a large comparative study on a representative number of samples to make really conclusions, yes. Uh, and also we have no details about the sample and didn't have a chance to to have it in a lab to, to analyze it and to check uh, the reason for it. So we are very open to do a comparative study with HRMS um, with any method developed. The only thing also we would like to request a bit more transparency about the validation so that we really know what we are talking about uh, when we compare the techniques. So now about the NMR, I discussed already this morning. So here uh, it's uh, also the same principle is, uh, as HRMS, basically, that we are looking specifically to markers that we quantify. And here, from our side, from our perspective, it's most uh, utmost important to have the database, even if you measure uh, the syrups directly to make sure that the signals you detect cannot be somehow present in some honey somewhere in the world that you might not have thought about. So in our view that is really the most important point um, to avoid also the risk of false positives. Also here I invite the labs to, to be more transparent about the validation and about the false positive rate. Um, I will um, also discuss the results for the NMR technology. So yeah, uh, what I wanted to say is that um, the quantification of the markers, once they have been identified, this is a targeted approach. But identification of the markers and of the thresholds, this is the non-targeted approach. And this is the, the huge work that has to be done up front. And this is based also basically on statistics, and that is for any kind of method, even for LCUP. Yeah? If you want to say what is normal, you have somehow to, detect, to put a threshold, and normally it's not a black and white situation when one marker will be present in adulterated honey and totally absent uh, in any kind of authentic honeys. So that's why it's so difficult also to, to have always the best performance. So we obviously choose at Brooker that we say that the risk to have a false positive is big, so that um, honey producer will be uh, treated as having adulterated sample is not the case. So we really want to, to take the decision to reduce the false positive at maximum. So currently with the honey 2.0 it is at 2.6 percent. This approach automatically increases the number of false uh, negatives, yes, because you will necessarily accept some adulterated samples in the range because it's not this black and white situation as I said before. And this is something uh, that I think is important to discuss with any kind of techniques, yes. And also the additional point I wanted to say is currently we look to markers in the sugar spectral region of NMR, but there is still a very high potential that is not used for the moment if we think about looking to differences in the aromatic region, which is more really compounds linked to the plants. But for that it would be really require that we have uh, markers specific to certain uh, varieties floral source or origin. Yeah. So we also need to know and check upfront what is the origin before then uh, looking for such specific markers. So now to the false declaration of origin. I have to speed up. Um, yes, we've discussed already this morning the pollen analysis can be cheated through the manipulation of the pollen grains through filtration and then addition of exogenous pollen. So we believe that NMR is a good addition to the pollen analysis. Um, 
So not just looking to one or few markers, because that can also be added synthetically to the honey, but look to the complete uh, profile of NMR, where we are really looking to hundreds of molecules at the same time. Yeah? And that, that uh, here, in that case, is a statistical analysis and requires a certain or a higher number of, of samples in the database to make such kind of models. And here, also, we have very strange um, criteria for validation of these kind of models with Monte Carlo cross-validation because also with statistics you could do whatever. So here validation is also very important and true positive needs to be at least 98% so that we release something. This slide I, I will now um, just skip because it's not, uh, because time is short. And to summarize also, uh, we believe what is important today if we really want to to combat the fraud, to, to put forces together, independent of the technique, yes, with NMR, with HRMS, put the labs together, have something centralized where all uh, laboratories uh, collaborate, also governmental labs, to define what is authentic or not, and then to have these open discussions about the thresholds, the purity criteria, and this constant adaption, because it's not set in the sand and it has to be constantly adapted, yes. And of course, also, we are not uh, relying on these 40 or 60 markers for years. We are also now working on the next versions to catch up more alteration. For that also it would be helping us um, and everybody if we would share also this access to syrups because this is something that can sometimes be really tricky so if the lab would also put here effort together that would be helpful. Yeah so thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you, Norberto, and um, welcome to uh, my short presentation about honey adulteration. Um, before uh, I come to the testing methods, I would like to, to give you or to show you a short timeline of the latest actions which have been taken um, against honey fraud in the last three years uh, to show you how important this topic has become. In uh, 2016, uh, the European Union uh, started a coordinated control panel on honey to assess the prevalence uh, of honeys adulterated with foreign sugars on the European market. In uh, 2017, um, uh, representatives from the US honey industry they formed a working group called the Honey Integrity Task Force to ensure the honey purity on the, on the US market. Then in January 2018, um, a technical roundtable on honey authentication took place in Belgium, where uh, representatives from uh, European authorities and, and honey experts discussed uh, strategies to fight um, honey fraud. Um, yeah, independent from that, in March, uh, a resolution on prospects and challenges for the EU apiculture sector was introduced. To, um, to initiate the European Commission to enact laws and to, uh, to take action inter alia uh, to combat honey fraud. Then in May, uh, Stefan Schwarzinger organized a workshop to define an authentic honey sample for future databases of pure honeys. Uh, in June, that is what uh, Gina already mentioned, and uh, the USP formed an expert panel to establish a honey standard for the United States. And then in January this year, the Apimonia um, distributed a statement on honey fraud, which uh, attracted attention worldwide. And then, uh, then just recently, um, two reports were published. Uh, one is the International Honey Market by Rod Phipps, and a honey white paper by the University of California, uh, which also have pointed out the alarming situation concerning honey fraud. So you see, um, this topic has gained in significance um, yeah, very much, last, uh, especially in the, in the last three years. 
So now I would like to come to the testing methods, um, also the methodologies. Um, they, uh, in, in, the, in the respect of, of the technology, uh, there was much progress in the last years, uh, particularly for uh, NMR testing and for HRMS. And here you see a list of parameters, uh, where most of them are usually offered by labs which are specialized in honey testing. Uh, the list is uh, structured by screening methods, by marker substances, and by uh, honey foreign enzymes. Um, I will not go deeper into detail, uh, this would be too technical now. I, I would just like to, to add that um, additionally to, to these tests which are mentioned here, um, also other parameters can indicate adulteration, like for example the sugar profile, uh, the proline content, um, high values of HMF and others. Um, the question is, do we have a magic bullet? Do we have a universal test which is able to detect any modes of adulteration? The answer, this is what we already heard today, is no, we don't have such a test yet. So, um, based on the current knowledge, our recommendation to, to screen the entire spectrum of adulterants is a combination of NMR, which is are yeah, very powerful due to its um, very large database of more than 80,000 80, samples. It is LC-IRMS, which is focusing on um, carbon isotope ratios of C3 and C4 sugars, and the honey foreign oligosaccharides. Um, this test um, detects um, oligosaccharides from starch-based uh, sugar uh, hydrolysates and is able to distinguish between natural oligosaccharides and added ones. Um, yeah, we should not consider, uh, or not forget to consider one very old test to check the honey quality. This is what we already heard today as well. The microscopical and pollen analysis in combination with the flavor testing. Um, and this can improve the interpretation of technical results uh, significantly. But nevertheless, we need to say that um, we do actually not have um, a complete a 360 degree view on honey. So that means that there's much more work to do for us as a lab. Thank you very much. Presentations with a speaker from the US and we will close with a speaker from the US. We will invite Jane Galvanis from Sweetwater Science Labs. This morning, uh, starting looking at the main six forms of adulteration. We've been talking about sugar syrups. I spoke to you uh, briefly about aliphatic resin scrubbing. We have immature honey harvesting, ultrafiltration, overheating, antibiotics, and pesticides. These are all different forms of adulteration that all of our laboratories have the capacity to test for. Once again, it's not an exhaustive list. There are other things that people can do to adulterate honey. And we look for all of these the techniques we use, NMR screening to start, other NMR methodologies that we're created at, at Sweetwater um, will actually accentuate what is being done with the screening process. We use LC uh, uh, triple quad and QTOF to look at uh, various other adulterations, be it antibiotics, pesticides, oligosaccharides, the other markers that we've been discussing most of today. Palynology, looking at the pollen, once again, an important aspect of looking for adulteration. We also have added something else, liquid chromatography NMR. This is a very important technique in metabolomics to look at how the bees are actually metabolizing the materials that they glean from out in the environment into their hive to determine whether or not something else has been added to the hive or to the honey when it comes back out. And of course we also have the standard color metrics and other wet chemistries that help with determining the quality of your honeys. And of course, the EARMS is still an important part of what we do. I'm going to 
I'm going to let this one sink in. We used most of the methodologies in the previous slide to test the honeys that are in the World Beekeeping Awards for this year. You will note how many honeys failed. <laughs> this is the power of using more than one methodology to determine adulteration. Once again, laboratory analysis can never be static. We must continue to always increase our values by creating better and better analyses every single day. This requires a lot of collaboration <laughs> between, for instance, our laboratories and the University of Missouri and a few other universities, but also between laboratories. This is extremely important. But also, as I said this morning, the production integrity in and of itself, outside of analysis, must be paramount. We must keep this in line. And I'm going to keep it very short. That is where I'm going to end this, this afternoon. Thank you very much. OK, uh, we have two microphones. On the central aisles. So uh, invite, we invite those who want to make uh, questions, please reach the, the microphone. The lady will assist you. that have developed their methods independently on different uh, libraries of samples to ascertain if the honey was authentic or not. But do we have any agreement between the laboratories if their partic particular method is as good as or better than their competitors? Maybe. Uh, it's important to understand with NMR you get a full fingerprint of all organic substances. It's the same instrument, we are all working with the same database, or most of us are working with the same database, so the result will be 99% the same. LCHRMS depends a lot because you have an HPLC before you actually analyze your profile. Everything that comes very early or very late on the HPLC just will be cut off. So I would guess 98% of all the substances 
are not even showing up. And I am aware that the different labs are using different talents, different techniques, so they focus on different parts of the metabolome of the sample. So I'm pretty sure that the results will be different between the labs, especially for New Zealand Manuka honey, for example. I would expect that there are big differences in the lab, between the labs. And this is also one reason why we state, okay, H LCHRMS is in a research state. If somebody sends us a sample, we will analyze it and with all precaution, we'll say, okay, this is still under research, but it's still not finished. And there will be one, two, three years more development and maybe also standardization between the labs. Who knows, we are interested in standardization, we are highly interested that the one honey industry gets one result, doesn't depend from which lab, but it's still a progress to go. Hi, Terry. Uh, clearly the answer is no. Um, but this has been the same with NMR. As NMR started some years ago, uh, different labs, different databases, now we have a harmonization up to, let's say, 98% in the results you get by NMR from different laboratories. Um, HRMS is very new. Uh, we, we started with that 2017, and I think we have the first lab where's the accreditation now for this type of technique. And as you can see from the presentations maybe, our lab has more than 400 markers, another lab has 11 markers or fewer markers. So that's the difference right now. But what I can see already, even that the labs are using maybe different methodologies, different instruments, maybe also different strategies to find markers for the adulterants. The markers already put on the screen are the same markers. So if we come to the point where the labs look at the same <coughs> markers, which are molecules with exact masses, which can be found in publicly available databases, you will get the same results. I think my, my question was really a, a leading question to get to the basic issue I have is about harmonization of methods. The challenge I think is going to be that with individual private organisations developing their own methods that haven't been peer reviewed internationally, is that how are those methods going to be harmonised? It would be interesting to hear from the uh, colleague uh, that's developing standard methods of how they are going to address A, those sorts of issues, and B, if you're using NMR or even multivariate analysis of eight high resolution mass spec methods, uh, which are really black boxes because it's just a multivariate analysis, how are you going to come up with a standardized method of analysis? So thank you for the add-on question. Actually, uh, collaborative study is something that the Honey Expert Panel has discussed on um, technically both of those types of methods. I'm going to refer to Lutz, who told us on Friday about something that the Joint Research Center in Europe did with, the, with this method, the HRMS. Yes, the Joint Research Center evaluated all the free techniques like stable isotope, LCRMS, NMR technology, and high resolution MS. And they made a statement that, that these are the most promising methods to use. So uh, that was also one of the reasons why now on the European level this technical working group in CEN started deal with this topic, to set standards, how to validate and harmonize targeted and non-targeted authentication methods. So um, I think this will be the line for the future, how to, to come to a harmonization at the moment. Uh, and if you look at the methods which are already in place for now 10 or more years, it is it takes so long time to come into a process to harmonize authentication methods until you have reached this aim, they are already outdated. So we cannot wait for HRMS to be harmonized to use it because we already know now that Chinese syrups are on the market which pass NMR testing 
by 40% of addition. So we need a tool to catch also these. And we cannot wait until this has been nationally or internationally harmonized. So the best, I mean, tool for the industry, and this has been also done already, that the, the honey packers or the honey producers association, they make trials together with the laboratories and see what works and what doesn't work, and we calibrate and on the improvement of the assessment. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Gail Dean. I am uh, one of the honey judges of the show uh, this year in Apollonia uh, from the Atlanta, Georgia area. And my question is more about messaging to those that enter um, Apollonia in 2021. As you know, this um, slide that was put up, I believe, by the gentleman from Sweetwater showed that there were quite a number of entries in a liquid and other honey categories that were tested and um, found to not be up to the standard. And I think that um, my question is, for instance, in the dark honey category out of 21 entries, 15 were uh, not allowed. So how are you going to message that for 2021 and will the same methods that you used this year be used in 2021? Will you continue what you've done here? Well, I think. Sorry. <coughs> well, that question is not for the for the panel. Of, of uh, course, <laughs> it's more for Ackerman. But yes, uh, in half an hour at, at half past three, we will have uh, the Ackermania assembly. And then after that, we will deal specifically with the World Honey Awards. And I think that's the place to better discuss. But I can anticipate you that we are working on this. We will have a communication release. And our commitment is to continue improving the quality of our products for the well-being of the beekeepers and for the what mean of the consumers. So thank you very, very much for the question. I would like you to repeat this question later on in the World Honey Awards. Okay, well thank you and I want you to know as a, as a judge, I do appreciate what you've done this year. Thank you very much. Value of 
I think they said ten million, ten million dollars for for an NMR of one gigahertz. That's really a small sum compared to the to the damage to the industry and also to the environmental damage. So and the third topic to, to mention is why in these tests that the, the analysis statements that the companies receive the, the mention of the failures, for example, now that Dr. Lutz mentioned the failure of the NMR, if I receive a statement of the laboratory, would it say, hey, be careful, this NMR test could fail 40%, or the test from LC, EA, IRMS, uh, if there could be an agreement to write this in the analysis, because sure there are here mostly people well-intentioned, but there are also here the people perpetrating the fraud and looking to be ahead. So right now, from these documents, without uh, further detail <coughs> mentioning the shortcomings of the analysis, the, the quality departments that need to buy cheap, 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 they're getting this document that will mean uh, a passport to authenticity for somebody that is not uh, entitled to this authenticity. I will try to answer the first part of Federico's question. Um, Apimondia role um, can be seen in the Apimondia statement of any fraud. It's, it was released some months ago, uh, and as I anticipated during this Apimondia Congress, Apimondia will again meet to start the programmed yearly update of the statement. As new knowledge becomes available and new voices are heard, um, the, the statement has to be dynamically uh, updated. But I can tell you that this is the voice of, of Apimondia, the statement, and the, all the continents are represented in this uh, working group, different specialists, so all voices are heard and well, sometimes maybe exceptions could be made, but never exceptions would be the rule. So, um, I would uh, like uh, my colleagues from, from the panel to try to answer the last questions because you have the list. So if you want to remind and if you would like any special participant to answer you, you can do so, Federico. I think any, any lab, any laboratory, commercial laboratory uh, from Europe could uh, say why this is not written in the analysis, the possibility of a false negative, in a, either in an NMR or an EA, LC, IRMS. That's One of the things that uh, we could definitely do is help you understand that the 40% that uh, my colleagues have uh, been uh, speaking to you about, that's only one particular syrup. And it represents a very small portion of the honeys that we receive that we've tested. So uh, don't think that, oh, 40% of the honeys are going to be passing through. That's, that's not the case. So uh, please don't uh, take home a message that we're, we're losing 40% of the honeys due to this particular syrup. It's not, that's not the case. Um, as far as um, one of the other things that, that we would also uh, state is that 
it's not just the NMR, it's also the other tests. We do this all at once because we want to have a comprehensive approach. Because if we, as uh, one of my colleagues said earlier, there's no circle bullet. So if, you, if we want to have, as an industry, a truly good product, we need to use a multiple point approach. Um, any further uh, about the NMR specifically, I'll, I'll defer to Bruce. Maybe I can add a little bit the, the ethics behind the lab, why, what is the way we are working. So we are highly interested to have a clear honey market without any alteration. So we are interested to have clear honey because just if we have a test report which says, okay, the honey is authentic, that will be a deal, the client can earn money and can pay the lab at the end of the day. So if you just mix syrups together, nobody needs analysis on this. They're not developing inside, so you know exactly what you're mixing, so you don't need this. So actually we don't know how much false negative we have, so how much samples are passing the higher mass test, but we are actively communicating you should do a combination of tests. This gives you the truth at the end. We do newsletters, we do scientific publications, we do round tables, we do presentations. So we do everything to inform the client what he should order at the end of the day. But we also can't force a client to order all this package, all the combination. If a client decides for himself, okay, for me the EA IRMS method is enough for me, which can be easily passed by a rice syrup or something, by 90% any rice syrup, we can't force him to do the other tests. Here I see clearly states in the position to force the clients from this country, like Mexico is doing for example, if you want to export your honey from country A to country B, you need to pass this, this and this tests. And if you don't pass this, you can't export it. But unfortunately there are still states in the world which are kind of collaborating or closing their eyes on the adulteration because it's a big business for these countries. But I see this on the state side because they have the actual law and the enforcement and we are just sitting between all the chairs of beekeepers, importers, <coughs> exporters, retail, so we are just neutral partners for all of you and we really can't enforce clients to say, okay, you need to test NMR, please do NMR testing and then we can't enforce them to do this. I would like to make two comments, sorry, on my perspective, why I don't add this information in the report. First of all, because uh, an unknown sample, you have no idea what syrup could be mixed. And we've seen that there are so many different types of syrups. So, I mean, does, in my opinion, it would not make really sense to make a comment about uh, every single syrup, because the report might end up with uh, several pages, yeah, and you don't know what is in your specific sample, so it won't be really helpful. It can be helpful maybe to know what separately what are the performance of the method, but here we, we need to know that with the screening methods, it's empirically determined what are the limit of detections because it's highly dependent on the type of syrups, how it is processed, and also on the type of honey, what is the variety, the origin. So there is so much variety everywhere that every lab is just making a rough estimation about what are the limit of detection. So even that information would be very difficult to deliver. This 40% that Lutz is mentioning is on a sample that has been made in the laboratory where he knows exactly because uh, this has been added to the sample. So of course, uh, in this kind of uh, sample that he has built in the laboratory, he can tell, okay, I know what is inside and does it pass or fail the different techniques, but that is a special case. That's not for him. Um, just clearing up the case with the 40%, okay? This has been, this is actual samples from the market. You can purchase this in large container quantities from Asia, and you can purchase the syrup depending on how much percentage, 20, 30, 30% you want to add it to honey. So that's not a laboratory sample, that's real life samples. And I agree to what my colleague from Sweetwater said. These are specific adulterations which occur mainly from Asian region. So this is, for example, for Mexico, this is 
not, not of any topic. Okay? So um, many of the recommendations the laboratories do, which kind of tests should be done on a certain sample, are dependent on the information we could get for the origin of the sample. Um, so if you don't have any clue, the general recommendation you will get from any of us labs is please use the best available techniques we have right now, like NMR, stable isotopes, HRMS. Of course, we know that's a lot of money you have to spend, but as the globalization moves onward, as the, the, the global trade of honey devices diversifies more and more, it's more and more difficult as a lab to give a recommendation even to you that I can, as, as a lab person, be really sure to give you a recommendation that you are 100% safe. That's not possible. That's simply not possible. The other thing is that there's currently not only the problem with general harmonization of a, of a testing scheme for honey authenticity, but also from the regulatory side, there's, there's no real guideline so far worldwide. I mean, what USP now tries to do, to set a standard and trying to define what is the best possible procedure or, or guideline to do honey authenticity. This has been now done for the very first time globally, actually. So even in Europe, we don't have a general guideline every laboratory can follow. So it's mainly based on the experience laboratories have and the exchange we have through the scientific meetings we here have each and every year. So every laboratory comes or between our internal agreements, what is are the best techniques to be used? From, I think from, um, from if you look at the analysis reports, if, if you read them carefully, you will always see some sort of phrase that the interpretation you, you get from the laboratory is based on, on the specific test done. So, we as a laboratory can you never get 100% confidence uh, in a report that your, that your uh, honey is 100% pure. We can only relate on the tests we have made. And as my colleague from QSI, Tentamus, said, we cannot force our customers, even if we would have known better what to test, uh, there are trade um, uh, agreements with specifications, and this is not something we decide. It's decide as a decision between the, the trader, traders, the, 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 um, the supplier and the buyer, so we can only give advice, we can give recommendations, we can yeah, try to, to, to um, give scientific publications, recommendations about what is best practice, but we cannot really force. So, but I think the next developments, what is happening in the international norming bodies regarding food authenticity, which will also deal with honey on the European and on the ISO level, we will get a global harmonization in the future. In this field, I have a question for all of you. Uh, does it exist some uh, uh, trial tests between all the labs with some samples who are going uh, black samples? And we developed this with an MRM. But with all the, if, is it possible to, if we can organize some, if we see Happy Mondial, I, I, I dream, send you uh, five different samples and ask you, can you find adulteration there? And we send this to all of you, and so we can compare all the results. Can be, can it be use, useful for you or for the, I think for the, the consumer they, are, they they will be interested by the results. But is it possible to 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 try to go in this direction or not? Yeah. Is it useful? Yes, for sure. We are 
very open for this. I, I mean, uh, this has been done already from several industry organizations. We would wish to have this also more from the official side, which has not happened yet. In Europe, we try to reach a coordination by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission to do this. And if Apimodia would like to do that, that would be also great. So then you can a neutral, make a neutral evaluation from all the methods available on a common set of samples, which is what is actually uh, lacking to date, because all these uh, trials which have been made already, we are all on different sample sets. Maybe this samples from the that we were sent it here for the competition. Maybe these are good because honestly, normally these uh, comparison samples are trade samples. So from the retail, which are normally multi-floral honeys, and they're pretty standard and they're not pretty challenging. But having different varieties, also buckwheat honey, for example, and heather honey and different varieties are quite interesting because they are more specific and uh, the probability of false positives are a little bit higher to say and they're more challenging so it can be an interesting approach and we are highly open to this it's our daily business to compare the quality between the results and this actually helps to all the labs yeah so we will uh, I, would, I would just like to add that it's in, in such uh, when, when, you, when we go such a way to, to make something like a proficiency test we should also consider to or you as a then as an organizer, as from, from the Abimonia side, to, um, to uh, organize pure honey samples, maybe directly from beekeepers, where you can trust, and then add uh, syrups from different sides of the world in specific amounts, 5%, 10%, and mix it up, and, send, yeah, and then send to the, to, the, to the labs, and then in order to yeah, to observe results and to observe differences. That would be uh, very helpful in uh, such cases as well. So I'm sure that we will think at this and to, we will try to organize something with this. Okay. Well, that's like, like if I say that. Uh, sometimes we, I think, when you are not well, if, as you are more informed, you are more confused. And I just want to mention, ten, Ten samples we took of the shelves in the European country. They all failed the EALCIRMS. All failed. Uh, they all passed the NMR. The ten, and the ten all showed sicos. Then a few of them showed uh, color, caramel, uh, other enzymes. Uh, of, so. I agree with you, there is a need of a comprehensive approach to include several analyses, but just think from not from the customer, as you say, you cannot force a customer, of course you cannot force a customer, but when you're helping, when your lack of action helps to perpetrate the fraud that has such a dimension, then it's worth to think twice about the measurement to make uh, a quite a uh, uh, barrier to fraud. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Amit uh, from India. Uh, firstly, I thank the Abimuni authorities who have given us a forum to discuss these issues today. So, most of us present here are either beekeepers, processors, packers, exporters, and the scientific community. But I think all of us here are consumers. So as a consumer today, I'm confused when I hear articles coming from people like Mr. Ron Phipps of the presentation shown that there is so much of honey today which is adulterated. This is actually creating a fear among consumers like us that should we continue eating honey, yes or no. So as an industry and as a happy it is our duty to create or build that confidence back into the consumer. And as the scientific community is sitting here, the labs are sitting here, I think you need to give us clear guidance. Don't mind my words, but it seems today uh, the beekeepers, the industry, today is working for the labs. 
the cost of testing is going up. You all need to get together. We have to put some kind of a budget to the testing cost. The beekeeping in many countries is actually done by people who are economically backward. If we want to do genuine honey business, we have to keep every cost in control. And the trend now is being competitive, is being lowest cost quality manufacturer producer. But as, we, I, as I was seeing the presentation from this morning, there are a number of ideas that are coming up, but there is no clear direction. So I am a pure commercial man, has some idea of beekeeping, but technically I'll request Apple authorities, people sitting here on the dash to give us a clear guidance. Coming on to the next point, uh, we are talking about harmonization. If I understand, LCIRMS test was introduced many years back, but still certain labs follow a different standard. Uh, I don't want to take the names of the labs, but it still is not fully harmonized. So in case a test which came maybe 10 years back is not yet harmonized by all the labs in here on the dais, how do you promise or confirm that the new test that we're talking about, HRMS and NMR, will be harmonized one day? Because as when we do business, there may be trade disputes. Uh, my customer or I may get a sample check at uh, A lab, it may pass or fail, and the customer may do it at the B lab. But in case it is not harmonized, that creates a trade dispute. So, and ultimately, who is the sufferer? It's the supplier or the beekeeper who suffers, because ultimately we'll give it back to him. And maybe he was innocent. So before we come out with a test, we must be 100% sure that this is reliable. Of course, consumer security is very important. We don't want any consumer any human being to have an edited product, but it is our responsibility to give him the right guidance. We cannot declare an innocent person that what you did was a fraud. Coming on to my third question is, uh, USP is looking after the new honey standards. So of course, honey adulteration, economic adulteration, it is a sin. We all believe into that. But are we also considering known contaminants, like glyphosate? Like in European Union, glyphosate is not allowed, it is checked, as we understand. But in many countries, including US, it is still not a check. But it is known health hazard. So do you, are you looking forward to, in that direction? Of course, as I said, adulteration of honey is bad. But maybe it is not so serious a health hazard as pesticides or antibiotics are, herbicides are. So as human beings, being aware of the food security, food hygiene, and our of consumers is USB looking after that as well. Thank you. I'll give my lab colleagues time to think on the first question. I can comment on the on the second. So currently our honey identity standard that we're proposing in early 2020, it is for the um, the purity of honey. It isn't. Um, we're not handling. I guess. Well, we have some contaminants, but we're not covering any of the. Um, like you say, glyphosate. I I would beg to differ that it's harmful. Um, there's scientific data to prove either side and. Not everywhere has a limit on glyphosate, and so that would be something that eventually, if need be, could be written into the USP, the FCC identity standard for honey, because once it's published, it doesn't mean that that's it. It's not a static document. It's, it, can, it can be updated over and over and over, provided there's data to support the changes, the additions or the revisions that we're making to the identity standard. But, I mean, so right now we're just talking about what makes honey, honey. And then we will add as, as better data are available to us. Okay, thank you. Okay. Who wants the first question? I'll take the second question. <laughs> I actually have a poster uh, about the economy, about <coughs> testing, and uh, I think Lutz showed it in his presentation. So if you did all the single tests for the single parameters, which are not even sometimes a money worth that you tested because the authorities know how to pass it, 
you spend much more money. So we have this in focus, so we, we already save money. If you do the three screening techniques, you will pay less than ordering all the single point techniques that, you, that are on the market. So this is one point where you already save money. And the question is at the end, if you have a lot of 20 tons of honey, how much is actually the testing on this costs? And how much does it cost you if your honey is adulterated? Or your buyer is not trusting you and saying, okay, from your origin, nah, your honey is always adulterated. How much money you can gain by actually demonstrating him, okay, look, I have here test reports and it shows it's 100% honey, it's not adulterated. So your supplier, your, your vendor, or whoever will pay more for your honey. And actually, the testing at the end is for free. So you actually can gain more commercial value. And uh, you know, the honey price is going down, down, down. I think there needs to be a different way. It needs to go up, up, up. Because uh, there is less honey in the world, which is not adulterated. So actually, you need to break this spiral of going, going down the price. And uh, I am also a poster where I have some calculations on and some strategies how you can avoid test, uh, how you can minimize your testing, uh, how, your money, how much money you spend for testing. And uh, yeah, we are aware of this. And we are aware that there's a budget of each company and you can't spend unlimited money on honey testing just to be aware that what is there. So there's always a risk. We want to minimize the risk together with you on the lowest cost possible. Thank you. And the main important question, harmonization of the test results. Because that leads to trade disputes. Well, I, I try to answer this question, <laughs> even if it's difficult, because I know I understand fully your position, and we as a lab understand this as well, because you are our, our customers, okay? So, um, well, for example, with LCIMS, I tried more than 10 years to get us to a point for harmonization. Now we are in the 12th year, and maybe next year we will have a beginning. So you see the timeline, if you go from a regulatory body, you see the timeline how long harmonization uh, takes. Um, the only positive uh, view I can give is that now uh, people all over the world realize that we need harmonization and that's why end of 2018, beginning of 2019, um, harmonization and norming bodies initiated these working groups on honey and beehive products in ISO, in CN, and I can only invite everybody, every country, to send his delegates to these bodies in order to actively participate in the harmonization. So the, the, the starting point is here, and now we have to put this work into the harmonization. I mean the willingness also from all the laboratories is there, but we need an agreement from all the sides, from the industry, from the and from the regulatory bodies, that would be the best. Because if all sides understand the same thing, if we're talking about the same thing, if we put the same benchmark levels or the same guideline levels, then everybody would be more happy than it's now, for sure. So, a uh, humble request from our side. Uh, Eurofins being the pioneer, the leader for this HRMS test, you start sharing your database with other labs, create a healthy competition so that we are more and more confident in getting the tests done. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it will work this way because uh, for NMR it didn't work that way either. I think it's more like bringing all the stakeholders in a harmonization body putting all the work together, making this proficiency testing, evaluating the test parameters, giving a harmonized protocol, giving harmonized interpretation rules. This leads to harmonization. Thank you.
Um, I mean, I would just like to, to add uh, one, one more comment. Uh, so you talked about the, the LCIRMS, and, and I, I also fully uh, understand the, the unsatisfying situation for, for you as a customer. Um, I, I would, would also like to mention that, um, uh, first of all, uh, it's not only NMR, it's also LCIRMS, where any lab has its own database for the validation of, uh, of the method, and the interpretation is based on these database and so therefore there are differences between the labs. Um, one step has been made to harmonize, to, to go this step to harmonize LCRMS. This was this um, uh, coordinated control pen uh, from the uni, uh, European Union. Um, we are still waiting for results and um, finally our hope is that they will establish a standard methodology for LCRMS, for the labs, finally. Uh, I think, uh, finally, it, it must be the case that we as a labs need to be forced to go a direct way. For From our side, we have um, our database, we have our knowledge, and we can rely on these results we are, we are doing. Uh, so, unfortunately, the situation is actually the, it is so as it is, and but we, I think there are steps uh, as Lutz has mentioned, also with the with the ISO norm, uh, but we need to be forced from the outside. Um, otherwise, it's, it's very complicated to bring everything together. So, one last comment from my side, or a request from my side. As most of you, especially uh, Eurofins and Entitech, are uh, on part of the European EC Directive, the committee that makes honey standards, and in case certain contaminants are not safe for Europeans, how can they be safe for Americans? So maybe you can share some database with the USB authorities saying that this contaminated, there was a research, there was a study done, and that's the reason you have stopped or put some limits for certain contaminants, and maybe you can pass it on to the US authorities as well. Thank um, you. The US is, is, a, is a different case because we, in Europe, or as I showed the definition in my presentation of food fraud, it doesn't really include contaminants. Of course, you say product is adulterated if it can contain some sort of pesticides and other things. What we are really dealing here with is, is a different thing. It's economically motivated adulteration. So it's not a health hazard issue, actually. I mean, you can adulterate honey with 90% syrup and that's not a health issue. So I think we have to differentiate those two things because also the type of testing done is completely different. Um, I mean uh, the, the data of glyphosate, I mean as, my, as far as my knowledge is, is well known uh, that glyphosate can readily migrate into honey so, uh, I mean, the problems are there, and at least I can only talk for, for our laboratory. A lot of glyphosate testing is done, also from the US. So, um, I think it's on the screen, and um, I'm not, well, the situation is different in the world. I mean, it's, uh, glyphosate is not really a health hazard or not really seen as a health hazard in, 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 in honey in Europe. It's more that it's not... Um, uh, glyphosate is, is, is not, it's an unwanted pesticide to be used in agriculture generally. So there's a high likelihood that in Europe glyphosate will be banned maybe in two years. So it's not only an issue of honey, but it's a general issue not to use this pesticide in agriculture. And of course here, in the United States, Canada, the situation is completely different up to now. Thank, thank you to all these questions. Um, uh, if I just may ask another question to the panel here. It occurs to me that there's still a lot of confusion about databases. You have a database, you, you so many databases. May I ask you one question? All the syrups from your database, do you source them on planet Earth? <laughs> yes. I, I consider this a yes. Um, all the honeys 
um, that you use to validate there's a cyber mark or not? Do you source them on planet Earth? Yes, I guess so. So I'm wondering when you all, we've seen numbers on how many cyrops are in these databases. I recall they're roughly the same. And I guess if there would be more and more honeys, which we may take some time, then a proficiency testing will very likely show that for the majority of the samples, all your individual databases, because they are based on samples from this market, from, from a global market, but it's one market, and you're quite likely to obtain all the samples, same samples, you will achieve a harmonized result for the majority of the samples. It will take some time. And this is what we just have to wait for. I think the, um, what is confusing us are a small number of samples, and in particular when we have new methods. So basically, I think the, the roadmap was already laid out here. We continue with development, and uh, we need proficiency testing, and we probably need some official body organizing this. And I think we need also education in the clients and the clients probably or the, the entire industry needs also uh, more education in terms probably also of beekeeping uh, practices. That was just quick questions from my side and you have something more to say. I would like to add a little bright spot in the uh, whole proficiency issue. Uh, those of us here on the stage who are laboratories uh, plus several others um, especially within the NMR realm, we actually already perform round-robin proficiency testing with each other. And uh, the most recent round that we've done, we all came less than a standard deviation away from each other from the same samples we all ran. So we are actually finding the same things at the same time with the same samples that have been given to us already. So this would be something that we can extend into the high resolution mass spec that we already are doing with the NMR. So this is something where we as an industry have already been doing for you. We just haven't really been openly discussing it because it's, it's something that we do as laboratories, as scientists, we, we think of this as routine. This is what we do. So please understand, we are helping create that standardization that you're asking for. We just haven't been fairly uh, uh, exuberant about it because we look at this as something, well, this is just what we do. Next question. Yeah. Hey, Luc Ilvo from Belgium. We have to ask the question, why there is so much adulterated honey on the market despite we have so many analytical possibilities? And this has to do with regulatory aspects. So um, even my authorities, they are reluctant and are refusing to take action because they cannot take action so long we have so many false positive results. So the harmonization has to especially lead to coming to a zero percentage of false positive results. And I'm a little bit afraid that even proficiency testing will show up the difference between labs and make it more difficult for authorities to take action. This is a very important point. If I see after uh, uh, improving the method, you still have 2.6% of false positive results. This is too high for uh, regulatory basis to condemn companies. And the second thing that I miss in the whole discussion, this discussion this afternoon is focusing on fake honey, on addition of syrups. But in my country, the biggest problem is the labeling. The labeling of polyfloral honey as monofloral honey. And there it's even becoming more difficult because there we even missing a good definition of what is monofloral honey. Here, for fake honey, it's clear. We are sure any addition of sugar is not allowed. And even here we have problems that our authorities cannot take action. How will you solve the problem for the mislabeling of monofloral homies? To clearly say 
there is a deserated honey and syrup on the market, not because we do the analysis and we don't have a standard, because it's a business model to do so. So there's a business model to produce syrup in a way that it's giving enough profit to somebody and somebody is willing to mix this syrup into his honey inside. So this is a bad side. We are helping to prevent this and not to help them to cover their deterioration. So I think this is an important thing. And this is an economic way that states can prosecute and they can check their borders, what is exported, what is imported. This is also an important part. So how much syrup is imported into a country and what is the trace or where, what is the way the syrup is going, to which company and what is this company selling. So this is also something that we maybe forget. We always focus on the final product to say, okay, what is in my final product or not? But actually you can trace this. If you're a state, you can put laws. You can say, okay, for the LCIRMS, I want to have a limit of this and this and this, uh, Delta Max, for example, or I want that the people are doing NMR or not. I think this is the task of the legislation in all the states. And uh, states are pretty aware of what is going on in their countries and what is exported. And if a country exports five times more honey than five years ago, something is wrong in this country. So nobody can explain to you why there's five times more production. And, uh, this is a way maybe also Avionia can create some guidelines and can give the state some ideas, but uh, this is the uh, origin of the problem and not the unharmonized yeah. lab testing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just comment on this? If I compare with other industries, if you look to meat industry, to milk industry, yeah, you also can substitute milk powder by whey powder, and there our government is taking action. And we never see such high percentages of adulterated products on the market, where goat cheese is, is made out of cow's milk uh, and so on. There we, we, because the methods are not giving false positive results, and when people go for a second opinion and they are accused, the second lab is giving the same result. And this is a huge problem for honey. People have the right to go to another lab and the, the other lab is providing a different uh, report and then when you go to a church, they have to release the problem. I can actually speak directly to that uh, because uh, Sweetwater is, is not solely working with honey. We work with products such as the goat milk to the cow's milk situation as well. One thing that uh, you must understand that the laboratories are limited to the samples that we receive. How is that sample taken? Was it taken by someone who is bonded to not be uh, uh, taken in by that company and say, hey, oh, give them this sample. Not this sample, no, don't, don't, don't look over here. No, 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 go look over here. You're gonna look over here, okay? That's something that we see in the laboratories, we're, we, we do not have the capacity, nor do we want the capacity, to go out and take the samples ourselves. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to analyze what we are given. How that sample is taken, who audits that sample, that is a, a part that needs to be taken care of, that we, as laboratories, we can't be part of that, that we then have a conflict of interest. We can't be part of that. So I, I, I hear you that we have this issue with the adulteration, but we don't know what samples we're getting unless we have a chain of custody from a known auditor that we know we can trust has been bonded to be trustworthy. So it's not just the laboratory and the normalization, it's also how we receive our samples. I, for one, have actually had where I had samples sent to me by a company and then uh, had bonded samples sent to me uh, surreptitiously, and they were two completely different samples from the same batch. And the surreptitious samples came back adulterated, whereas the sample I was given by the company itself was not. So there, there's more to it than just is the testing right or wrong. It's also, how do we receive our samples? Uh, do we have space for an 
last question because the time is concluding, so I invite the next. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, panel. Um, uh, I was aware of the uh, honey adulteration, but quite frankly, I was just not um, aware of the, um, the extent of it and the amount of work that's obviously done. Um, to me, it's very commendable because it, it protects both consumers and beekeepers. Um, however, what's been said today has um, highlighted uh, several points. Um, um, I'll try and keep it to two, but it's obviously an international problem. I think we've got an international panel of at least um, uh, five nationalities up there. Um, <coughs> so it seems to me that um, it's an international problem, therefore we need collaboration. Uh, I come from the United Kingdom, and the vast majority of our beekeepers are hobbyists. Therefore there's not the pressure from perhaps the commercial beekeepers um, to, um, uh, to get the authorities to do something. Um, and what concerns me is that perhaps um, adulterated honey will be diverted from one source or one country uh, uh, to another. Um, if that's the case, we need, I think, probably further collaboration. Um, and uh, I'm asking myself whether the nature would be um, a um, uh, an answer, um, but it's probably an Apimondia problem. But certainly, um, if, if these folk are doing their work, we've all got to be working together. And is there any way that we can um, avoid the honey being diverted from the countries that have got um, a much tougher um, uh, detection uh, methods than those that haven't, perhaps like, like ours? Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have had an interesting exchange of ideas. For sure, you have to, to know that Apimondia's commitment against honey fraud will never end. And uh, thank you for all speakers. Thank you for all the questions. And we are, we are online and uh, we hope Next happy moment meets us again together with new results, new tools, and a better perspective. Thank you very much, and see you soon.